Nate, thank you so much for joining us today. I know that your message is going to really resonate with our listeners. I'll start this with telling our listeners the inspiration for this podcast. Nate and I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago about uh, Nate coming into Beyond 90, which is our program which takes our members from 90 days up to one year alcohol-free, which is important when you are overcoming a habit, a dependence, an addiction to alcohol. Nate joined Beyond 90, and during our conversation, he used a phrase that just really caught my ear. The phrase was virtuous cycle. Virtuous cycle. Nate, can you let our listeners know what that means and what that means to you during the process of having released alcohol? Sure. It's good to see you, Victoria, as always. Um, I'll start with just the definition of virtuous cycle. So a virtuous cycle is a chain of events in which one desirable occurrence leads to another and that further promotes the first occurrence and so on and so on, resulting of a continuous process of improvement. And so the one desirable occurrence for me was the decision to live alcohol free and join P90. And then throughout the course of, uh, you know, as the weeks picked off in P90 and started understanding more why I drank and my eyes were open to the world beyond alcohol, I started experiencing things that were very positive in my life that made me want to further double down and buffet and strengthen my decision to live alcohol free. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Nate is, has, has, is generous enough to have agreed to share some of his story. What led him to making that virtuous virtuous cycle decision? So Nate, can you tell us a little about, about your background and how you came to the moment of joining Beyond 90, uh, Project 90? Sure. Um, well, currently I'm a healthcare consultant, uh, a partner in a healthcare firm. Um, but kind of moving back in history, I started drinking in college. So I, I did not drink before I went to college, discovered alcohol early on in college, and then just kind of went haywire with, uh, using alcohol during college. Um, that then stayed with me, you know, through grad school, um, you know, which kind of takes me to, you know, maybe 20 years ago, uh, still, you know, maybe during the week cut out drinking, but, but at parties that we would either host or parties that I would go to, you know, getting drunk was the norm. There wasn't any, um, you know, just having one or two glasses of wine or, 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 you know, cocktails or whatever continued through into uh, adulthood, marriage with kids, but really Victoria over the last, um, you know, three to four years, uh, the, uh, dangerous habit of getting, um, frankly drunk during the week started creeping in more and more. Um, drinking alone, uh, hiding my drinking or trying to, we can really never hide our alcohol from our family as we all discover sooner or later from my family. Um, and then, you know, the last six months or, you know, the months leading up to the decision to join AFL and P90, um, just, uh, got out of control. And was, uh, you know, leading me versus me leading it or controlling alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, uh, so then we arrive at the decision, if I may, to join P90, kind of the, 
the the episode there or would you like to mm -hmm. i'd like to just uh, dive into that so if i'm hearing you correctly you didn't drink at all in high school you started in college and you really liked it yeah it was uh pretty quick from uh zero to 60 you know maybe mm. like a second wow um, wow and uh you know, it turns out there's some kind of family history of that, as I, you know, now come to know mm -hmm. more about, uh, uh, I guess I'll say my susceptibility to alcohol. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it did not take long for me to enjoy alcohol uh, immensely. And mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it just, you know, stayed with me really kind of ever since. Ever since. Yeah. I, I, I highlight that because... I think it's important for people to understand that this can look different for different people. Uh, you've heard my story, Nate, that I was, I drank in college, had very few consequences, just some hangovers and, you know, silly experiences. Uh, got married out of college, had my children, barely drank. It's not, I thought, because I also have a family history, I thought I had dodged that bullet. And when it came back into my life, after the passing of my mother, I was having panic attacks and such, uh, it was very, very slow. It was a very slow descent. And that caused cognitive dissonance because it didn't look like what I thought problem drinkers looked like. I thought, wait, 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 wait. Uh, so for our listeners, it's, it's, uh, I think this is an invitation to release preconceptions about what a problem drinker looks like. We can look very, very different. Our experiences may be very different, but the feelings are the same. And then <clears throat> when you grew up and had a family, you did what so many of us do, which is put some boundaries around your drinking. Oh, this is a little too much. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'll just do it on weekends. Except I feel like when people do that, and I did it too, I, you know, manage, budget my days, budget my drinks. What would happen? Tell me if this happened for you. It sounds like it did. Uh <clears throat> I would squeeze all of my drinking into those drinking approved days. Is that what it was like for you? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then slowly, because alcohol is, can be relentless. The weekends weren't enough. You weren't, you weren't able to, to scratch the itch enough on the weekends. And that's when things started getting really sticky and sneaky. Yeah. Um, for the longest time, you know, any party that we would throw, speaking of, you know, kind of compartmentalizing it to weekends or parties or parties that we would go to just included a lot of drinking, um, which, you know, as you kind of mentioned was normal behavior and, and, and still is normal and accepted behavior mm -hmm. everywhere. Um, but uh, again, a couple of years ago, it started creeping in where I was, I found myself filling what I thought was a void, mm -hmm. or sometimes that can be described as boredom mm -hmm. or just like a mental escape. And my, my solution was alcohol because I thought, well, you know, I feel great at these parties. I have such a great time. That can probably, you know, give me a better experience doing anything, watching a ball game, uh, whether it be on TV or, frankly, one of my kids' sporting events. Mm -hmm. And so it just, and then it just lives in your life rent-free and in your head rent-free and becomes a solution, what right? Or so you think that's a solution. And well, there I was. I was kind of trapped. Very, very well put. Uh, yes, as, as parents <clears throat> and workers, 
life can, as much as we love our families and we may really enjoy our work, there's a tedium to it. It can become tedious. And so when we have so much fun on the weekends, spot on, it makes sense to say, well, gosh, I love going to my, to my kids' games, but or to the ball games, but why not just have a, a few drinks and elevate this experience? And alcohol loves when we do that. Like, heck yeah, I'll make everything better. Don't you worry. How yeah, did... and then one of the, well, I'm sorry to interrupt you. And then one hmm. of the challenges in, is when you try to stop that and then you go to said event, you feel like you're missing something. Mm -hmm. So it is, it itself is its own kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. And then you're just kind of off to the races and mm -hmm. um, before you know it. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and as you've learned now uh, through the neuroscience that we teach around in project 90, you understand now how that happened because Alcohol gives us such a hit of dopamine and serotonin and GABA that it does elevate an experience for the first 30 minutes or so. And then, then come some, some consequences, but it makes sense that then if you go to a game or something like that, without it, your brain has stopped creating a normal amount of dopamine because it's been become accustomed to the drug. And so ball games feel boring. And you look around you and you see the alcohol and you're like, wow, I know how to make this better. Ah, I said I wouldn't drink. Ah. And that is yeah. that is exhausting. Yep. And then the then you spend all your time thinking about how much you don't want to drink or how much you do want to drink. And you find yourself, or at least I found myself spending a huge amount of mental mental energy on the drink or not drink did i drink too much and it's unsustainable or at least it, it got that way for me it's so much and 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 again for our listeners nate and i had some different paths but ultimately we ended up feeling exactly the same way and so i'm i'm going to take a guess that Many of our listeners are nodding their head right now saying, me too, that's, that's what it's like. And we can't even imagine the, the freedom that comes when that negotiating and bargaining and rationalizing is no longer, no longer an issue. It is a life-changing experience. And I can remember the first, I'm not sure exactly when, oh, I know when it was, when I made the decision to join P90 and make a contract with myself, which I think are the most important contracts we make, frankly, mm -hmm. to not drink, which I had been hedging on for years. And I probably guessed that other people were, you know, do I be, can I drink less? And but that mental energy expended on walking that line was still immense. And once I made the decision, it was a light bulb and a huge amount of mental space opened up. And it was, it was a freeing and just existential experience. It, it was, I, it was, uh, I remember that week and just how I talked with my family and my, you know, including my wife and life-changing mm. to be sure. I remember when you came in and you were extremely committed. Uh, you also went through periods of extreme discomfort mm -hmm. in the beginning. So that's how it goes. You, you were 100% in, you know, in this program, you have skin in the game it is, you know, you, you are expected to show up at a certain amount of, of group coaching calls. You're expected to connect with members on Marco Polo. You get a video each day. And those are, that is part of our agreement with one another. 
you have expectations of us and we have expectations of you. And I admire how, how you stuck to that commitment. I remember one call in particular, and I, I don't remember the topic, but you were, you were in early days and uh, you were very uncomfortable. But then you showed up again on the next call. And I thought, yeah, there he goes. Yeah, I think part of that, or maybe even most of that uncomfort is at the beginning, you're, ad you're admitting and recognizing a lot in yourself. And while it's positive and good that you're starting the journey, mm -hmm. you're also coming to the realization that the way you've been living has not been ideal. And so that first, well, for some people, it's just the first week. For some people, it's the first month. For some people, it could be maybe all of P90. I mean, you, you see a variety of experiences and we help one another along in there, which you know, it's an immersive experience. Um, and that's probably, I'm sure, what you were seeing, Victoria. Um, there are calls with tears, uh, both good tears, bad tears. Uh, but you're finally meeting the challenge head on. And that could be uncomfortable. Yes. In a good way, I would say, in a good way. I get that. Yeah, yeah, it's... Uh... Well, it's like other things. We we start the journey and no one ever says it's going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it. And working with a group of high achievers, these are people who, who are accustomed to that feeling. Like, okay, yeah, I'm going to put in the work in getting my degree. I'm going to put in the work growing my business. I'm going to put in the work to do what I know is going to be worth it. When you're dealing with alcohol, there's more emotion involved. And yes, you start to see yourself, the version of you that was under the influence. And you go, oh, yuck. Yeah. There's some cringeworthy moments, but that just can also, if you use that, I guess, those um, uncomfortable feelings that can keep pushing you um, yes. to uh, change that around. Absolutely. And, and, and again, back to the educational part, part of our program, we, we remind you that what alcohol did to your brain and how it impaired your judgment and your decision-making and uh, remind you that that's not who you really are. The person showing up, the, the person who is brave enough to make that decision, because these are not people who have lost everything, but they care enough about their values and their families and what they want that they say, I'll do the work. And that's who you really are. You are that, you are that guy. You are a guy who wants to live in a virtuous cycle. And you, exactly. just, can't, you just can't do that when alcohol's got a hold of you. Uh, I certainly couldn't. I would uh, be tough to uh, it'd be tough to envision a scenario where someone could, if you were being really honest with yourself. So, yeah. Yeah. Being honest with yourself can be uncomfortable, but it's liberating. Oh, completely liberating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as you went through this process and like you said about the virtuous cycle, that one very important decision led to other things can you share some of those other things that kept you going in the right direction certainly um so 
I think uh, when I was when I was using alcohol, I you know it was I thought it was helping me fill time in a in a in a positive way, which sounds horrible to say out loud right now. <laughs> um, and as those of us who are going through this journey know and could come out the other side and begin this virtuous cycle, it's the exact opposite. So when you eliminate that and it opens your mind and your time to other things, that's when the virtuous cycle begins. So at first for me, there were, um, I guess I'll say more simple, but very important things that started that cycle. So noticing that I was a better listener, had more mental capacity to spend on things that were worth thinking about and I needed to think about. Um, being able to have more energy for, you know, physical workouts and improving my physical health and mental health. My anxiety, you know, now is almost gone, um, which is saying a lot for me. Um, yeah. My confidence level went up. So all of those things then feed in to wanting to, you know, commit in an even um, more committed way to an alcohol-free lifestyle. So that, that's what I'll call kind of the first stage, the things that you may notice quickly. And then I connected my P90 experience, and we talk about this, uh, as you know very well as a coach, Victoria, uh, with wanting to use all of this newfound energy and time to connecting back to my community. So my community of my family community, um, my community with my children and their school, my parental community and other, you know, parents and friends that I had, you know, not seen in a long time because here I am sitting on the couch doing whatever, drinking, thinking I was you know, accomplishing something. And then for me, my spiritual community, and you and I have talked about that. Mm -hmm. um, I happen to be a person of, of faith, but spiritual can mean anything you want. There, there's a huge spectrum on there, but you, you then, you know, without alcohol, have that time and mental capacity to reconnect with your spiritual side. Mm -hmm. And it's, the joining of those communities, Victoria, that really started the major virtuous cycle in my life because that is so rewarding personally. And then you're giving back. Yes. And, um, you know, giving back to your community, uh, giving back to, you know, being a productive member of society you know, your little village around you mm -hmm. is extremely rewarding. And um, that's the virtuous cycle that I now find myself in. That's amazing. Uh, I know many of us, myself included, and uh, many of our listeners can, can connect to that because they do have, they have multifaceted lives. They have their professional organizations, their community organizations, their kids, their schools, the ch churches or whatever other growth things, their yoga community, whatever it is, uh, alcohol isolates us. And even, I'm curious, Nate, even if you weren't spending your time sitting on the couch drinking that particular day, I'm wondering how your, for many of us, we experience self-loathing, shame, things like that. I'm wondering if you can look back and say, maybe I wasn't drinking on that particular day, but I stayed home anyway because I felt what? Completely. Yeah. So even if you're not drinking, for those of us that 
uh, are familiar with this. First of all, you're recovering physically. You're recovering mentally. Uh, my anxiety would be spiking as a natural introvert. Um, and so uh, along with a number of other things that just keep you or kept me isolated from trying new things or even things that I was familiar with, because you could think of a zillion reasons when all of those things are in your mind as to, you know, kind of why you can't do this or can't do that yeah. versus thinking of reasons why you can, which I was only able to do once alcohol was out of my life. I mean, I would do, you know, some things here and there, mm -hmm. but maybe at 10% of what I'm doing now. Um, and uh, I was just uh, sick of wasting that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know that's going to resonate. It certainly reminds me of the old me. Uh, we do use a lot of that word can't. Oh, I can't make it. I couldn't make it to places if, if, if they weren't going to be serving alcohol. I thought, oh, what a drag. I would go if it was something that if I was required to go. Um, but, ew, you know, so much more fun if we have some wine around. And then, like you said, just the, the feelings of um, not feeling good about yourself, knowing the truth, knowing how much you're drinking. Uh, leads us to feeling very inauthentic. <clears throat> and you mentioned the word introvert. I don't know if you've paid attention to this, Nate, but so many of our members are naturally introverted. So when we, you know, it's it's hard enough for us to go out there and engage and be seen and when you're feeling that way about yourself, having secrets and things you don't want people to see, you're going to find reasons to stay home, even if you're not drinking that day. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because you have your, I was in the mental state of thinking I needed the crutch of alcohol to engage properly in all of these activities physical activities probably not so much i mean i wouldn't go i wouldn't you know have a few beers and then uh like go for a run or anything yeah, although that's good i i you know i'm surprised i didn't actually now that i think about it but um yeah it's all of those things uh right you just invent ways that you can't do something or you shouldn't do something or it's going to be tough without alcohol mm. versus when you're living alcohol free even if something is new um or something that you're reintroducing yourself to you're so much more awake and aware and able to engage that it, that it, it it makes the experience frankly even if it's a little uncomfortable because you aren't used to it just that much more real um and that's what causes the dopamine the adrenaline all of the good biochemical rushes now instead of um you know useless old alcohol mm -hmm. yes we use the word curiosity a lot in our program and instead of oh this going to this party is going to be hard or whatever event going on this vacation going having this conversation with someone is going to be hard uh we we've used the word curiosity get curious how do you know that are you sure what if it's great and you can see the light bulbs going off over people's heads like Gosh, I never even considered that it could go well. Yeah. <laughs> I loved those conversations. And that certainly started me on uh, the, the 
trail of positivity, the kind of what if. Mm -hmm. And even if I'm at a party or an event or, or whatever, and, you know, you kind of think, well, gosh, with alcohol, you know, I was either the life of the party or you're constantly talking. Well, what if I went to a party and mostly listened? How, how would that, and it's actually really fun. And you, then you engage in things that, in conversations uh, that are meaningful to you. Um, I don't want to say deep in all respects, but deeper, maybe, you know, more interesting rather than just superficial which mm -hmm. is if you're at one of those parties and you're just drinking on it's impossible there was for me to get into a conversation that had true depth to it mm -hmm. or if i did i would forget it so well exactly you know. and and i have found that <clears throat> because like you I'm, i tend to be actually very introverted uh, I, I, I play an extrovert <laughs> on demand, <laughs> push a button extrovert. I mean, look what I do for work, but, uh, definitely on the more introverted side, naturally, I enjoy both parts of that, of my personality in that way. Um, but I have experienced that I enjoy social gatherings and People appreciate someone who remembers them, someone who can recall things about the last conversation they had. I can't tell you how many times I went to a party and met someone for the first time, but it was actually the fourth. And hopefully, you know, gosh, I can't imagine how that looked. It didn't look good. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, I've met you three times, Victoria. Oh, yeah. So it really does um, make us uh, a valuable part of social gatherings because we are listening and we're remembering. Yeah, and the magical thing about our brains is when you stop handicapping yourself with alcohol and you start re-engaging in these communities, as I mentioned that I have, and some of these folks I haven't had a many, meaningful conversation with in a long time, you actually start remembering things from years ago that with the fog of alcohol, mm -hmm. I would at least never remember. Mm. And that's an awesome feeling. So yes, there's this process of kind of restarting your engagement with with community, with your family, with whomever it may be or whatever setting. But once you do that, it can really gain traction quickly, mm. um, which is a fantastic uh, experience to have and extremely emotionally positive mm. and makes you want to relive that, you know, day after day. Exactly. Yeah. I like to say that we're done running from alcohol. We are running toward the life that we want. And when we start to live the life that we want, we up our pace and we chase what we want. Absolutely. And it feels yeah. so good. So when alcohol comes knocking, you think, why would I give this up? What I'm running toward, what I'm receiving, the gains that I've achieved for a 30 minute high. Doesn't right. Makes sense. Yeah, and I'm new enough, in, you know, along the journey now, uh, probably just over a hundred days in, where I'll have cravings or go to a party. Um, so I don't want listeners to think that uh, the, you know there's this automatic immunity that happens where you don't have that. Um, and sometimes those can even be very powerful. But once you are living in this, I guess, to give, get, get back to our kind of phrase, virtuous cycle, you are then able to step back and think, do I want to give that up and kind of just stop, stop that and have to restart it if I can? Ugh. And you quickly conclude, you quickly conclude that it is, it is 
I'll just speak for me. It is not worth it. It's not even close. Mm -hmm. So um, it's becoming easier and easier, but once you're connected to those communities and people and chasing things and like, I love what you said, the pace just quickens. So the cycle or the wheel gets faster and faster and faster because mm -hmm. you're able to absorb and experience much, much more and handle a lot more. Um, it's just mm -hmm. not worth it. Right. Right. And I love that you touched on, <clears throat> on the fact that, look, yeah, I still get some cravings as, as much as you're doing in your life. <clears throat> pardon me, as much as you're doing and achieving in your life, uh, the physiology of healing from addiction hasn't changed. Your body is still learning these new ways of thinking and being. And alcohol hasn't forgotten your name. It's going to tap you on the shoulder. Uh, that's part of the process. And <clears throat> one of our goals is to liberate you from uh from the guilt or shame or the i shouldn't be feeling this now uh, and understanding this is this is a physiological process and the best way to move through it is with support connection accountability and paving a life for yourself that will eventually make alcohol very small and irrelevant. So thanks for sharing that, Nate. So Absolutely. As, as you move into Beyond 90, you are at about 100 something days now. What excites you? What, what are you really, what are you running toward? How are you quickening your pace? What's ahead for Nate? Uh, well, I mean, it's really just continuing that, that cycle. I'm, I'll, um, I guess I'll kind of re repeat myself a little bit, but it's the further connection to community, um, and being a more, maybe even being a leader in some of these communities, which is unthinkable when I was using alcohol, um, at least for me. And, um, that's what really has me excited. It's okay. I've now re-engaged with these communities. I would say I'm kind of benefiting from being in these communities more than perhaps I'm giving into them or um, maybe that was phrased incorrectly more than I'm uh, adding to them. So the next phase in what I'm excited about is, you know, being an additive uh, member um, you know, being uh, like a force multiplier to these communities and really showing my true potential, um, you know, with these people and, and uh, organizations um, that I really care about. So that has me excited because now I have all of this energy and mental capacity to commit to that. And, um, you know, really the sky's the limit. And it's a great feeling. So well said. And and I'm I'm so excited that you are continuing in this community of, you know, really just like-minded. This is, you know, like-minded individuals who want the same kind of kind of thing. Um, working within our community, our community, our little community of Beyond 90, <clears throat> where you can share those dreams and those goals and well, and check in with us and tell us what you're doing. Be celebrated. Uh, and if things get tough, be supported. You know, continuing that that vulnerability that, that we just start to scratch the surface on in uh, Project 90. It's, it's really exciting. You have so much to offer in our little world, but certainly to the world around you. So watch out, world. Well, Nate thank you Shell. for that. Yeah, Nate Shell is back. <laughs> yeah, hopefully that's a good thing. At least Nate for me Shell it is. Two, so. Nate, Nate <laughs> Shell 2.0. That's that's what the world gets today and tomorrow. Sounds fantastic. So, fantastic. Well, thank you, Nate, for being here. You have a beautiful message. Very inspiring. 
it's always an honor to work with our members and then have the chance for this time together to interview you and recap and and dream. So thanks for sharing your experience with our listeners and spending time with me. My pleasure, Victoria. And thank you uh, for your support um, and the other coaches. Uh, it has uh, been life-changing. So uh, very much enjoyed our conversation. Thank you, Nate. All right, listeners, until next time, take good care and have an awesome day.